national day to opt out. On this webinar, we're going to be focusing on research and commissioning. The outcomes from this webinar, you will have a better understanding of why practice data is used for research and commissioning. We'll see how NHS Digital is going about implementing the uh, ability for us to uphold the national opt-out in relation to this, some overview of what the technical solution is going to look like, and then we'll also go through some examples of where practices are providing data for research and commissioning, how the practice will need to um, look at the data flows to ensure that the national data opt-out is appropriately applied. As we go through the webinar, um, do contribute qu any questions through the chat box that you can see in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. We do have a member of the team who's going to make a note of them, and then we'll come to questions at the end of the presentations. So don't feel that we're ignoring you if we don't deal with them as they pop on the screen. We will come back to that at the end. So this is the fourth webinar in the series. We've done webinars on what the national data opt-out applies to, how to support patients in the um, in understanding the national data opt-out, and the last webinar was one for Caldecott Guardians about the practice responsibilities. So today we're looking at the kind of data that is used for uh, research and planning, and the practical aspects of where you might need looking out at data flows to make sure that you understand what's happening and why we need to why we need to do it really. So for our panel, there's myself. I'm the uh, clinical champion for patient data choices. Uh, Phil Evans, who is a practicing GP, who's also in the National uh, Institute for Health Research Clinical Research Network. I think that stands for. Um, David Painton, who's a clinical champion with the RCGP and lead for commissioning, and Paul Arrowsmith, who's the senior project manager at NHS Digital, charged with making sure that all of this works smoothly and efficiently for us. So, first of all, I'm going to hand over to Paul to walk us through where the um, where NHS Digital is up to with the program. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So my name is Paul Arrowsmith. I'm a senior project manager from NHS Digital, and I work on the technical work stream of the National Data Opt-out program. Um, being from the technical work stream, I am going to focus on on technical things, and in particular the the upholding solution. But I'm also representing the implementation team today. So these first couple of slides that I have um, are going to focus on um, what we're doing around the implementation of the of the National Data Opt-out. Uh, the first, first of all, we're going to look at um, the requirements on health and care staff and then talk a little bit around communication materials that we have for both patients and staff. So looking first at the requirements on the health and care workforce. Uh, in terms of implementing the national data opt-out, it's important obviously that information governance leads, Caldecott guardians, data protection officers, are all aware of um, the national data opt-out and, and aware of what needs to happen. Organisations need to be looking at local policies and procedures around handling data inquiries and making sure that those policies and procedures um, include references to the national data opt-out itself. And then obviously it's about preparing and informing staff, making sure that they know about the policy and procedures on handling um, data use, handling inquiries about data use, um, know about the national data opt-out itself and know where to signpost patients to the NHS.UK website where they can set their set their preferences or, or if patients are asking for it give them the telephone number so that they can set their preference using that method and we'll come on and talk about that in a little while. So thinking about um, the communication materials that we have, um, there are posters um, entitled Your Data Matters to the NHS, um, so we'd be keen to see those posters being displayed in organisations and, and the handouts that we have been made available to patients when they attend 
health and care organisations. Uh, we need to look at uh, existing posters and handouts that you have locally. They need reviewing, they need removing if they're out of date or updating to make sure that they make reference to National Data opt out correctly. And then also thinking about um, screen text that you, have, that you may have on electronic displays, making sure that privacy notices are up to date, and then also um, increasing awareness of workforce materials. Now those last three points, the, the screen text, um, standard wording for, for privacy notices and the workforce materials themselves, they're all available uh, on our website that you can see there at the bottom of this screen. Okay, I'm going to move on to the, the technical side of things now. I'll talk a little bit at a high level how it works and how the upholding solution sits in the end-to-end -end process for the National Data Opt-out Programme. Talk a little bit um, about the, the pilot that we're about to embark on for the upholding solution and, and the next steps for yourselves as well. Okay, so before we dive into the upholding solution itself, this solution gives you a high level view of all the technical components that make up the National Data Opt-out solution. Over on the left hand side there, it, it's all about empowering patients. So in the top left hand side, we've developed a website so that patients can log on, enter some demographic details to identify themselves, and then they're free to set their national, national opt-out. But it's also about empowering patients that either don't have access to digital uh, technology or perhaps feel uncomfortable using web-based services. Uh, and for those patients, we have the NHS Digital Contact Centre where they can make a phone call through to our operatives. And, and I guess from that position, two things can happen. Our, our operatives can either help patients that are using the website and perhaps have, have hit a little bit of a problem, and our operatives will talk them through that and get them through to the end of the service. Or they can take control, our operatives can take control, take the, take the demographic details and set the preference on the patient's behalf. The key thing though is that the, um, the, preference, the, the patient's preference is stored once on, on the spine and that's really where patients are empowered. So no longer are patients having to go to each different healthcare setting where they attend for treatment. And historically they've had to set preferences in each local site now they just come through to NHS Digital and store it once on the spine. Of course, the trick then is how do we make that opt-out available across the health and care estate? And that's what we're going to come and talk on in a little while on the next slide. Before we go on to that, though, just a couple of things on the dates at, at the bottom. The, the service that enabled patients to set their preferences, that came on stream uh, on the 25th of May this year. And on the same date, NHS Digital began upholding those preferences as well. So NHS Digital, we've been live since the 25th of May. Um, the thing that's not on this slide is Public Health England. So Public Health England have recently become compliant with National Data Opt-out. They've been upholding since the end of August. Um, the only other hard and fast date that we have within the programme is March 2020. And by this date, there's an expectation that all health and adult social care organisations will be compliant with the national data opt-out. So the upholding solution itself then, um, in, in coming up with this design, we, we try to come up with something that is going to work for all health and care organisations. So irrespective of whether an organisation has spine compliant systems maybe, or a, a HSCN connection, and also thinking about the, the technical capability of an organisation. So you can imagine in, in GP practices where we've got the GP systems, uh, but also thinking about the large trusts where they've got um, large IT departments with, with uh, quite, a, quite advanced technical capability. They'd probably be able to develop a, a more automated solution, but then we also need to think about spaces where um, social care, small care homes are operating. Um, where they haven't necessarily got any technical capability. So we've got to come up with a solution that's going to work for them as well. And also thinking about the, the volumes. So with large organisations typically uh, are sharing data on a daily basis. And again, picking on care homes a little bit, they might just be disseminating almost as infrequent as once a year, maybe at the, at the financial year end. So again, it's just um, supporting those kind of different scenarios. So the solution is based on something called MESH. I'm hoping you're all familiar with that. It stands for the Messaging Exchange for Social Care and Health. 
And this is the strategic solution that NHS Digital have in place for transferring data files between health and care organisations. So it's typically used already um, out in health and care for transferring results to path labs, for instance. And it's also used in the visitors and migrant service. So it's already proven technology that there's nothing really new here. So I'll just talk you through how it will work for the National Data Opt-out um, Programme. The idea is that every time an organisation has data to share, they need to look within that data set and pull out all of the NHS numbers that are involved within that data set and formulate all of those NHS numbers into a standard file. It'll be a very simple file, just a single column CSV file containing those NHS numbers. And that file gets attached to the local mesh mailbox. So you need to get a mesh configuration, get a mesh mailbox assigned to your organization and fire that file into that mailbox. The file then makes its way over mesh across to the mesh mailbox at the NHS digital end and connects into that spine interface on the right hand side of this diagram. And we just can do a simple look up across the NHS numbers that are contained in those files and do a cross-reference against the national data artifacts that are held on the span. The critical thing to understand is that we will return the file and what that file will contain is the same set of NHS numbers that you sent to us, but with the opt-outs removed. So what you, would, what you receive back is telling you which data records you're free to share onwards. Okay, um, just a couple of other things on this slide before we move on. Mesh, as standard, has encryption built in. So if the messages are intercepted on its way to us or its way back to you, then um, the third party intercepting the message wouldn't easily be able to read the data that's contained. Uh, and the benefit from your point of view, of course, is that there's no requirement to do any encryption before you send it to us, and there's no need to decrypt it when you receive the data back. So you'll be able to see the NHS numbers in the clear as soon as you receive them. The other thing to note is that we are already in dialogue with the four main GP system suppliers to make them compliant with this solution and that work is ongoing as we speak. Okay, I've mentioned the pilots earlier on. We're already working with um, trusts and, and GP practices in this space. It's fair to say that it's mainly with trusts. As I say, in the GP practice domain, we're, we're kind of dependent a little bit on getting the solution in place within the GP systems. But there are potentially scenarios where GP practices will need to be or, or are sharing data outside of the GP systems. So you probably just need to look at that and think about any, any data sharing activities that you've got going on at a local level that are outside of the GP system. And we'd be quite interested to hear from you if you've got that kind of scenario. And we can look at involving you in the pilot for that purpose. Uh, the solution isn't quite yet available. Our intention is to deliver during September 2018. We've hit one or two hurdles in the final testing rounds, um, but we are still anticipating that that service is going to be available within the, within the next week. And then we move into full engagement with our pilot sites over the next three months through to the end of this calendar year. As I say, we are working with a set of trusts and GP practices uh, right now but if anybody listening to this webinar is interested in getting involved uh, i'd be very keen to hear from you and there's a there's a website there's sorry there's an email address that you can contact us on at the end of my set of slides having said that i'm looking for volunteers it's probably only fair that i give you an idea of what's involved in being a pilot site um, it really breaks down into two phases the first phase is to do some work um, analyzing your information flows and on, on the back of that analysis we'll make an assessment in terms of your suitability uh, for the pilot. Uh, once we've got to that stage we then move into phase two and this is all about um, the, the pre-work really, um, carrying out the mesh configuration, making sure you've got a mesh mailbox allocated and then a little bit around local communication so making sure that your data owners are aware of the national data opt-out and exactly what they need to do to interact with the solution and we then move into a scenario where you'd be applying um, the solution against each of your information flows during that time frame of, of the pilot the last point is is quite an important point we can what we're saying here is that we can be flexible with you so we recognize that there, there might be a little bit of 
um, nervousness around some of your information flows you might want might not want to uphold in some information flows from day one so we can be flexible you know we can pick and choose which information flows we're going to include within the pilot and then move on to a full implementation as we as we move into 2019. This slide is just giving you an idea of the kind of information we're looking for in terms of that analysis piece, that phase one of the pilot. What we'll do, if, if you are interested in being involved, we'll send you out uh, a pro forma, and this is just an excerpt of a, of a table within that pro forma. The pro forma will give you some information around the policy so that you can make an informed decision about which information flows will need to have the opt-out uphold upheld. But then we'd like you to populate this table, giving us a little bit more information about information about each information flow. So what's the format of those flows? Is, is the NHS number included? Because that's critical to this. And then how frequently are you disseminating that data and, and what's the volume of data involved? Um, we do recognise that a lot of organisations have already done this kind of activity as part of the GDPR exercise earlier this year. So if you've already got this information in, in a in a predetermined format that you did for GDPR, we'd be quite happy to receive it in that format, just with those um, four fields on the right hand side added to inform the, the national data opt out piece. Okay, so that's it for me. So, as I say, if anybody is interested in, in joining us on the pilot, then if you can please contact us through that um, mailbox, that'd be much appreciated. I've just got one. Final slide, just by way of summary, I mentioned the deadline, March 2020, that's the hard and fast deadline that we've got for all organisations being compliant. It's not that far off now, and it seems it seems a while off March 2020, but it will come around quickly. So I think it's, it's quite important that all organisations are starting to think now about um, scenarios where data use are happening beyond individual care and whether opt-outs need to be applied. Um, and please contact us if you think you will have to apply opt-outs or, or if you need some assistance in terms of understanding the policy, please get in touch and we can, we can help out with that. And on the flip side, of course, if you think you do need to apply opt-outs, again, please get in touch, particularly if you want to get involved in the pilot, um, but also thinking about engaging with the service into 2019 also. Okay, so we'll move on to David now, I think. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, yeah, so we'll pass over to David, who's going to tell us a little bit about the data those being used for commissioning and, and why they're really important. David. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Good, excellent. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's important um, and why I think getting that information that allows you to track um, over time what happens to individuals without knowing who they are obviously um, is so critical to developing better pathways than we have at the moment. So we can move on to the next slide. I don't know how many people have seen this slide but this is a simple, this slide was produced originally from data in Scotland, brought together 300 practices and looked at multi -morbidity, the morbidity of the population. And this slide looks at the age of the population compared to the number of long-term conditions they had the blue is those with no long-term conditions. The next red strand is those with one long-term condition. The, the sort of olive green is the number of people with two long-term conditions and so on and so on. What this demonstrates is a very complex picture. And I think probably what I like to think about it is that in, in Southampton, we know, for example, by the age of 45, at least one person had one long-term condition. But of course, by the age of 55, probably about 50 percent of them will have at least two long-term conditions and so on and so on. So this presents quite a complex picture. If we move to the next slide, which it, um, sorry, um, this looks at the impact on the system, which basically says that the more long-term conditions you have, the more problems you have, the more likely you are to end up in hospital. But of course, not only the more likely to end up in hospital, but actually the more both for hospitals, but also for primary care is increasing and escalating exponentially. And it's all due to the rise in the number of long-term conditions and complexity. And we'll know this from our day, so daily surgeries, how many people come in with three different problems and where do you start? But if we move on to the next slide, 
What this is trying to say, and this is a slide which looks at some of those long-term conditions, and don't worry about the details, but if you look at something like diabetes, which is um, about fifth down the line, it says basically that only 14, 15 percent people have just got one long-term condition. 86 uh, percent will have at least two long-term conditions, 70 percent will have three, and so on and so on. And what this means is we have a very complex picture. When we start to add in things like depression, anxiety, social problems, um, social isolation, what we get is a very, very complex picture. And it's impossible, really, to develop a simple profile of our population using these the data sources that we have by tend to basically focus on one particular problem at a time. And that leads to really a genuine problem where we have no real single version of the truth, what's happening to our population. We may know how many people have diabetes. We may know, if we're lucky, how many people have got diabetes and COPD. But what happens to them? And what happens if they have another problem, et cetera, et cetera? We really have very little idea. And what this leads to is a very complex, confused picture. And I'm going to move on to the next slide now. And this, and please don't look at the detail, but this looked and this is a piece of work we did locally in Southampton about three or four years ago to map out the pathways for friendly as they went through accidents and emergencies. And you can see this looks like a bowl of spaghetti. It's like a complex wiring diagram where no one can really tr understand what's happening to an individual. And of course, within complex systems, I've lost you. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I've got you back now. Within complex systems, um, what happens is um, it's really hard to know that if you change something in one part of the system, what happens in, a, in another part of the system, because our systems are so complex. So if you look at the complexity of our system, we start to look at primary care data, because I think primary care general practice is where all this information comes together and allows you to build up a real picture of the truth, a real version of the truth. But if we move to the next slide, and I'm just looking at some of the, the data sources that exist at the moment within primary care, and most of you will know all these things. So we do have prescribing data. We do have diabetes audit. We do have MyQuest. We use charts sometimes to look at, for instance, the number of people with chronic obstructive airways disease and how many of them are smoking. We have frailty and obviously risk stratification tools. But all of these are looking at one part of the picture, a static lens that looks at the whole, that looks at the individual parts of the system, not the whole. But of course, what we also think, which allows us to look at what's happening to our system in a dynamic way. What happens over time to people with different com com number of complications, number of problems, how many readmissions for frailty get, go on, how many of those admissions and readmissions are linked to isolation, how many of the people being in care homes, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm saying basically is commissioning has been trying to work with its arms tied behind its back because it hasn't really had a real dynamic picture in front of it that allows you to plan better pathways. That, I think, is the heart of what we're trying to do, is to try and understand better what's happening to our population as a whole. So I'll end it there, but I'm happy to take some questions um, right towards the end. Thanks. Thank you for listening. That's, that, that, that's really helpful. So perhaps now if we can move on to um, uh, Phil Evans to talk us through the research side um, from primary care. Have you got control, Phil? Uh, I have, Jeff. Thank you very much. Uh, just coming over to me, is it? Should be. Uh, be a second. I'll just introduce myself when I get my slides working. Well, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. Yeah. Not sure that's me. Well, that's me on there. So, well, uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for inviting me to take part in this. It's great to be here and to take part. I'm Phil Evans. I'm the uh, a GP here in Exeter, and I'm the CRN National Specialty Lead for Primary Care. And I'm going to tell you a little bit now second i think about what research is going on in the crn and what we're getting up to um so next slide please 
Well, I'm, I hope to do a few things, and we will rattle this because I'm conscious that time is precious for all of us. Going to do a little recap about the NDO and the National Data Opt-out. Going to little look about GP research and what's actually going on, how we can contextualise research that's happening at the moment. And then I'm going to look at some of the detail uh, in the practices. Uh, I hope a number of you on the line are doing uh, research, perhaps CRN research, and look at how the, op the National Data Opt-out could impact on research that we're currently doing in the practices, but then look about epidemiology and the sort of big picture stuff that you've just been hearing about from David, uh, how it might impact the opt-out, might impact on population research, and lastly come back to the practice and look at a bit more detail. So I hope that will uh, will work. Uh, can I have my next slide, please? So. As we've been hearing, and I'm sure those of you who've been on the previous webinars will know well by now that we had the 25th of May 2018 when, of course, GDPR came in. And as we were hearing, the NHS National, NHS Digital National Data Opt-out came in. And I think the important thing from a research perspective, which I'm sure you've heard elsewhere, is that although this could be perceived as being a really tricky time for GPs getting their heads around all these data, the data issues that have come in, initiatives that have come in, uh, a lot of things are still the same. And it's um, something we're going to talk, pick up just through my little brief talk now. We're going to talk about the common law duty of confidentiality and how that still applies. So some things have changed and some things haven't changed. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to just recap, as you know now by now, the uh, NHS Digital's National Data Opt-out are these type 2 data opt-outs which apply only when a confidential patient information is used for purposes beyond a patient's individual care and treatment. And again, as you know, I'm sure, uh, this has to be empowered by a section of the NHS Act known as Section 251. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a gradual implementation. And, and as we've already heard, commissioning and research are lumped together in this part of the uh, of the Act. If you look at my next slide, you'll see that uh, it's a good question, really. What is research? I mean, if you look at the National Data Opt-out fact sheet, which I'm sure some of you will have seen, this is for patients, but it gives us an interesting idea of what is what research is. I mean, we all have our concepts of what research is, but it's going to help us look at diseases and illnesses and their treatments. That's the top bullet points, identify risk factors for disease and severity, which we've just been hearing about from David, and monitor outcomes of new drugs or types of treatments. And that's essentially the sort of gamut of research. And that's, of course, research is, as you can see there, been referred to as being used for purposes beyond individual care and treatment. And that's clearly the case. So for any data to be used, this reassures patients at the bottom the patient's individual above their individual care and beyond their individual care and treatment there should be a benefit both to the health and care system and it won't be used for insurance or marketing purposes again all that's in the in the literature that's available to patients but it helps to clarify what research is looking at my next slide uh, is an interesting one because you you wonder really why what where, how we're going to do research in the face of, a, of an opt-out but as we know very clearly from Dame Fiona Caldicott when she did her review, uh, that it's very clear that all patients have a right to be invited to take part in research. And it's very good news for us who are researching, of course. But as you can see there, she, she, they state that the people should continue to be able to give their explicit consent separately if they wish. And that's something we'll come back to, uh, to be involved in research as they do now. And they should be able to do that regardless of whether they've opted out of their data being used for purposes beyond direct care. So it's a really important, uh, uh, very important statement. I come back to that and its implications for the practices in the second. On my next slide, I'm going to look a little bit at how research is going at the moment. Uh, as, you, as I said, I'm part of the NIHR Clinical Research Network. Uh, we've recruited over a million patients into primary care over the last 10 years. Just gives you a bit of background here. Um, last year, we helped to recruit over 150,000 participants into studies, and of which we have currently 200 on the books. But I'm pleased to say for those of us in primary care that we're the highest recruiting specialty. And perhaps more importantly, for the purposes of this talk, uh, just under a third of all practices are recruiting patients into studies. And, and um, a number, a further number, are doing what we call PIC studies. They identify patients and refer them on for research studies. 
And also, as I'm going to mention in a second, 14% of all practices at the moment, although hopefully that will improve, uh, are submitting data to big data, such as the Clinical Practice Research Database. And I'm very pleased to say we promote the College Research Ready accreditation, which some of you will know about. And uh, we've got just over 700 practices doing that. On the next slide, I'm just, just highlighting, basically, we've got 15 networks across the country. And uh, you can see where, which is your local network if you don't know already. But as far as this is concerned, there are local experts, information and research governance experts in the local, in the local networks who could give you some information and help if you should need it. Now, on my next slide, I'm just going to look a little bit at the types of research that GPs are doing and the potential impacts, which is really what I'm going to be talking about now, of the national data opt-out. So traditionally, GPs approach patients in various ways. Uh, you can approach a patient, and, as you can see there, in a consultation, face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, by yourself or a nurse, uh, increasingly by practice nurses, for both uh, either an academic study or a commercial study. Uh, perhaps more usually, patients are approached by letter and we, we identify who could be potentially eligible by virtue of having diabetes, for example, and then doing what we call a search and mail out. So identify those who might be eligible and then mail out uh, directly to the patient uh, but and, and saying that it's coming from the practice and would you be interested in taking part in the study. So that's one of the most common ways of using and recruiting patients in this way. Uh, and it is just possible that patient could consent elsewhere, for example, in the hospital, for data to be extracted from the practice. And as we'll see through this brief chat, uh, consent trumps these opt-outs. So individual uh, consent trumps the opt-outs. And lastly, I'm sure the practices on the line will know that a lot of them do contribute uh, anonymized patient data, or in some cases, pseudonymized patient data, to research third parties. And we're going to come back to that to in, that in one of our scenarios later on. Uh, on my next slide, oops. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I think there's a slide before that. And before that, that's it. Okay. So just to sum up, just to sum up what the type 2 data opt-outs will do. And I, I should have a sort of caveat here that a lot of this is being worked through at the moment, as you've been hearing. But we don't think it will affect one of the, the main things that we do as researchers. And one of those, as I just said, is how we screen the notes of potential participants. So having a type 2 data opt-out won't stop us doing that and won't stop us mailing out. But it may well... Uh, but we still have to abide by the duty of confidentiality, as we were saying, and this common law duty, which you will have come across, I'm sure. But we can amplify that later if needed. As I just said, if patients have consented to take part in a study, their opt-out will not apply. Um, it has no effect on anonymized data opt-out. There are definitions of anonymization, but if it's anonymized data being extracted, that won't apply. And it doesn't apply retrospectively. And my understanding is it doesn't apply on the personal stratification data that the CCG extract. Um, and that was mentioned earlier. But it does affect and will affect uh, some uh, uploads. For example, we think it'll upload the uploads to CPRD will be affected. Uh, and a bit that I'm going to come on to in a second, but it will bias to some extent, those studies that are already using uh, Section 251 approval. And perhaps the most important bit, or one of the most important bits I was going to say, I think, is the bit at the bottom there. The practices do need to inform patients, both under GDPR and privacy notices, but also with the national data opt-out as to how their data is used for research purposes. And I know a lot of practices will already be, uh, be looking at that at the moment. So if you look on my next slide, I just want to talk, look a little bit. This is a, 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 a the patient flows and how this will affect epidemiology. This is an interesting paper. Uh, I found this sort of schema which shows where the blocks are, if you like, in terms of both the type 1 and type 2 opt-outs. Uh, we might come back to that in, uh, for purposes of time in a second. But on my next page, that's looking this paper that I found, which came out early on this year, and basically it's one of the first papers looking at the research impact of the national data opt-out. 
And they make some very helpful points, and I'll show you one or two slides in a second about what they said. But it is clear that opting out from uh, the, from the nationalism, uh, there will be differential opt-out rates. And for those of us who are academics and researchers, we'll need to be aware of. And they very neatly showed this uh, in a study they did around London City Airport, looking at the effects of pollution. And what they were saying is on a small in a small area around a small part of England, this may be important. Uh, and they went on to demonstrate that. So in my next slide, you can see that geography is important. If you're doing academic work across the country, you can imagine that the, the data opt-outs are going to vary across CCGs. Uh, this is data from NHS Digital. It's a bit out of date now. I think this is March data. But you can see about 2.4% of people by then had already opted out. And the map is actually CCG map, but the darker the color, the, uh, the, the, more, the higher the prevalence of opt-outs. So if you ran studies across the country, you might expect a bit of differential opting in uh, and opting out. And the next slide is interesting as well, because for those of us doing perhaps doing big data work, um, there are differentials in other areas as well. And this is a, a graph produced from that paper, actually, that looked at the level of deprivation status. In other words, how affluent or deprived the patients were and how, how, whether they were more likely or not to opt out of a type 2 opt out. And perhaps, as you might predict, the more affluent the patient, slightly more likely to opt out of, of with a type 2 opt out. So these things, all, these things all have to be borne in mind when we're doing epidemiological research. And also over the next few years, as the implementation process you've been hearing about takes place, we, these, these figures might change and we're going to have to watch this very carefully. But it's something for us as researchers to bear in mind. Uh, my next slide just brings us back, I think, to the practice and just a brief reminder that um, we still have type 1 opt-outs in place. Um, my understanding is that they are still to be applied within the practice until the March 2020 figure we were hearing about. But interestingly, they don't affect the ability of the practice to screen patients for potential recruitment within the practice, and they clearly don't affect consent to take part in the study. So these are the sorts of nuances of these uh, implementation of the data uh, opt-outs that we're just trying to grapple with. And my next slide just is something I've been working on. It's a bit of a work in progress, but basically I'll be looking at the differential, the different opt-outs and how they might impact on research. Um, probably haven't got time to expand this in great detail now, but just to see that some of the opt-outs will impact on research and some won't. Uh, perhaps that's uh, enough to be said on that, but it, it just show that everybody needs to be thinking about research from the patient perspective and the data flows that are happening. And then last but one slide is just some conclusions about this. But the good news, I think, from me as a researcher and, and certainly from me within the network is that the national data opt-out will will produce some impact on research and research active practices, but I would expect that at present to be minimal. Uh, for example, we're still able to search and mail out to patients as we were doing previously. And as I hope I've shown just now, it will have a small effect on population level epidemiology uh, and, and other studies in big data. And my recommendation to you is if your practice managers or administrators or GPs would be just have a look at what you're doing in your practice in terms of research. It's often forgotten off, off research, of practice activity. So what are you doing? Document your research and the data flows as you've just been hearing about from Paul and how it might be affected by the national data opt out. Uh, and my last slide is really just a number of resources. There's an increasing number of resources out there for practices who are concerned about the implications of all of these data issues on research. Uh, and uh, we we'll hopefully be able to circulate those later for you to have a look at. So thanks, Jeff. I hope that was helpful. Lovely. Thanks ever so much, Phil. That, that, was, that was very good and very clear. Um, and just to say that uh, one of there are some additional resources that aren't on there, which are the, the RCGP toolkit and e-learning modules that we're producing as, as part of this program.
and these webinars, the three that, are, that we've done already are already available. And this one will be going on the RCGP's website as well for people to, to review if they wish. So having seen the, the importance of the use of the data and some of the issues regarding um, research for, for the national data opt-out, uh, I'm just going to run through some of the ways in which this data flows and, and what it means for the practice. And I think for me the most useful way to analyze any flow or to look at it is what's actually going, what sort of data is it, and what's it for. And based on that, you'll be able to decide what legal basis would be permissible. And once you see which legal basis is permissible, it is being used, you'll be able to see if the national data opt-out applies and make sure that it is appropriate to, to, for the data to flow. And the frameworks, as Phil referred to, are both GDPR, which is new, and the common law duty of confidentiality, which is not. We've actually had this duty for a long time. It's a common law duty, which means it's not in statute law. It's been built up over the years through case law. It is in addition to GDPR, so it doesn't exempt you from any of the duties of GDPR, vice versa. And it relates to any situation in which you're sharing information with anybody. Common law duty of confidentiality, unlike GDPR, acknowledges the concept of implied consent. And that applies where you're sharing information with another clinician or somebody else who's actually going to be providing care for that individual. So that is the only place where implied consent actually functions is to an individual to somebody who would have access to that information to provide individual care so if you're using it for another purpose and you but you still wish to share the the, the information there are a number of ways in which you can do that one is consent obviously if the patient says you can do it and knows what they're saying you can do it but also, a court can require you to provide the information. It could be in the public interest to provide that information. So, for example, if a patient comes into you and says, I've got three loaded weapons in the back of the car and I'm off to 10 Downing Street, you may consider it to be in the public interest to alert the police to this fact. Um, that is a fairly obvious case. It can be more difficult. And if you're considering using public interest to set aside confidentiality, I would very much recommend consulting one of the specialist bodies, either the GMC or your defence organisation, who will be very helpful in situations like that. And I can vouch for that from personal experience. There are then two other legal gateways for setting aside the duty of confidentiality. And these are the two that are principally concerned when we're talking about research and commissioning. Phil's already mentioned the NHS Act 2006, Section 251. And that permits you to override your duty of confidentiality. So a study which has been to the uh, confidentiality advisory group and obtained permission can then contact you as a practice and say, I have got permission for you to override the duty of confidentiality and provide this information. But as a practice, you don't have to do that. The other is section 259 of the Health and Social Care Act 2012. And that is a power, that gives a power to NHS Digital to require the practice to provide the information. It can only happen on a direction issued to NHS Digital from either the Secretary of State or Public Health England. <coughs> if of them issue such a direction to NHS Digital, they then must issue a Section 259 uh, date provision notice to you and you must then provide the data. The thing that's important about that is that when it's permissive, the national data opt-out will apply. When it is mandatory, certainly as the policy stands at the moment, the national data opt-out will not apply. So the national data opt-out applies to use for research and planning or use beyond individual care. The research and planning is the sort of summary used to try and explain it simply to patients. 
It applies when the legal basis is permission under Section 251 of the NHS Act 2006. It does not apply when the patient has themselves given consent, and it does not apply when Section 259 of the Health and Social Care Act is the legal basis for NHS Digital to require you to provide information to them. Uh, section 254 there is the section of the Health and Social Care Act under which Public Health England or the Secretary of State can require NHS Digital to gather the data. Sorry about the sort of numerological soup. The thing to remember about the national data opt-out is that your duty of transparency under GDPR is still there and part of that will be that your um, privacy notices do inform people about the national data opt-out and when it doesn't, doesn't apply. So I'm going to use that to whip through three scenarios where the practice is providing data for um, research and planning purposes. The first scenario is where it goes directly through the clinical system. The second is for some third party suppliers who, have, who hold the data for individual care, but then also use it for other uses. And the third is where data is being collected by a visiting researcher, or perhaps you're being asked to send data in to either a commissioning body, a primary care organization, or a research organization. So in number one, these extractions take place through a thing called GPES, the General Practice Extraction Service. It sends a requirement to the GP clinical system, the GPCS. The GP clinical system will submit the NHS numbers to the spine service, which will, as Paul indicated, strip out the numbers of anybody who has an opt-out in place and return it to the system. The system will then run the report that produces the required information and send that back to the GP extraction service for use. The important points to notice there are throughout this process, although it's fully automated, you are still the data controller. And your GP system supplier, the person who supplies your clinical system, is a data processor on your behalf. Now, that would mean under the Data Protection Act that you would have to have a contract with the data processor to confirm that they're processing the data in full accordance with the law. But since um, a long time ago when the contract came in that moved GP system suppliers contracts to the CCG, you don't actually have a contract with your GP system supplier. Your CCG has that contract. So there is a deed of a data processing deed of undertaking in place which covers that legal obligation. So you are covered by that data processing deed of undertaking. The second scenario applies to certain third party um, or subsidiary suppliers who provide multiple services to the same practice. So they may be providing, for example, an appointment book service but also providing um, data extractions for commissioning or for research to third parties. In this case, the third party will collect the clinical data from the GP clinical system for all those uses. And the GP clinical system provides a, a bulk upload of the relevant information to the third party system. When that information is to be used for purposes other than individual care, there must be a check to make sure that a national data opt-out is being applied if it's being done under Section 251. So that third party system will need, by some mechanism, to get those NHS numbers to the spine service, to have the national data opt-out numbers removed and returned to the third party, prior to processing for that secondary use, that use beyond individual care. You're still the data controller. On this occasion, the third party software supplier is a data processor on your behalf. 
So you need to look at the contract on who holds that contract um, for your practice. It may be that you have a direct contract with the, with the third party, but it may also be that the CCGs purchased that on your behalf, perhaps through a GP SOC call-off agreement, in which case you must make sure that there is either a separate data processing contract or a deed of undertaking. The third scenario is the common one where you're taking part in a research project where either you're asked to send in a, a spreadsheet of information about your patients with gout or whatever, or the research body says, and we'll send our nice researcher out so that you don't have to do all the work, and she'll look through the records or he'll look through the records to gather the information. The practice gets the information, <coughs> and it will be the practice responsibility to make sure that somehow the NHS numbers are checked against the spine service. Have those um, patients with an opt-out in place removed from the list before that list is used by the practice either to generate the report or to pass it to the researcher who will then pass it to the research body. The practice will be responsible for generating the list. You are the data controller and the data processor in this situation and you're responsible for making sure that the checking is done. Now that may be done through a solution with your GP clinical system or there may be another mechanism, but you'll be responsible for making sure you know how to do it and that it's done. And the only people that can look at the numbers and process the data before that is done are the users who have that legitimate relationship of implied consent because they're people who also have a responsibility for caring for the patient. So I hope that um, rattle through makes some sense of, of what it means in the practice for applying the, uh, the opt-out. Um, we've had a couple of questions here, um, so we'll deal with those. And if anyone else is, has questions, please do send them in to us. I would just reinforce that this webinar will be appearing on the um, RCGP website, so it will be available for uh, people who want to pause, go back, and uh, take two or three goes to, to listen to what we've said, as I know we've, we've rattled through. Um, we've had a question here, at what point will a deed of undertaking be signed with CCGs, and do we need to identify who will be managing this? Well, you should, I presume that's relating to that um, third party instance that I was referring to. That should have been considered at the point where the call-off contract was put in place because the third party is, is processing data on behalf of the practice as a data controller, not on behalf of a CCG. So it should have been done at the time of putting that contract in place. So if as a practice you're using one of those systems, I would contact your CCG who put the contract in place, ask them to see a copy of the deed of undertaking, and if it isn't there, I'd be asking them to um, get the skids on and make sure it's put in place because you're current, well, you and they are currently processing data um, out with the strict requirements of the, of the Data Protection Act. I hope that makes sense and hasn't frightened you too much. <laughs> um, and I think that might be it for the questions. We've... I'm not sure if that means we've been so wonderfully clear that everything is or whether everybody's sitting there reeling and somewhat baffled. Uh, David, do you, do you have something you want to add in at that point? No? Well, a couple of points. Um, yeah. One was, I think, when you were question about what is research that came up earlier, which I think is really quite important because I think what we're looking at is research that helps us understand population health and population health flows, not individual treatments, which I think is a different, uh, a different level of um, undertaking. Um, but I think it's an interesting discussion at another stage. But I really wanted to ask about this whole issue of data controllers, because certainly I'm not sure how many practices actually do have a data controller that understands these issues. One can explain them in sort of relatively simple terms to 
the 99.9% of the population that aren't on this webinar. Yeah, well, I think that's a really important point, Dave. And one of the things that's concerned me for many years is that practices are data controllers. Because we are independent contractors and we hold data, we are data controllers. And I think there are a lot of practices out there who perhaps have not really appreciated their responsibilities um, until recently. I think GDPR has raised the issue a lot. So I think more people are becoming aware. But it really does highlight the, the, the fact that you are, you are responsible for the use of data going out of your practice. And for every use, whether it be research or commissioning, where you're sharing confidential patient information, there must be a legal basis. Um, and for, I mean, for example, the, the mapping of the frailty pathway there, where you were using confidential patient information, if any of that was passing outside the team with the implied consent relationship, there would have to be a Section 251 approval to approve that use of data um, for it to flow, or else it would have to be done with consent. So practices need to be asking, whenever they're asked for data, what's the legal basis, where's the approval, is it Section 251, or is it going to NHS Digital under a Section 259 of the Health and Social Care Act? bearing in mind that the only people who can collect data under that direction are NHS Digital. It can't go to anybody else. So, you know, if your commissioning group is asking for data, they should have a Section 251 if it's, a, if it's going to be identifiable. Right. Is there any merit in the college perhaps trying to do... I know, for instance, in our area, the Federation has said that they would um, put in place some... Um, some uh, guidance around uh, GDPR, but I'm just wondering whether there's any merit in the college thinking about what would be the essentially a job description of a data controller working in a surgery, irrespective of whether you're doing it in one surgery or the group of surgery. Right, but I think it's important to distinguish between the data controller, which is the person who has the data and who makes the decisions about how it's used, which is the practice. And I think what you're probably referring to is the data protection officer. Yes. Yeah. who is the person under GDPR who is responsible for making sure that the practice is complying with its duties as a data controller. Um, there is actually, there's a link on the um, RCGP toolkit on patient data choices to the Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire LMC who have done a very good document on this and I would, I would heartily commend anyone to look at the materials we've put together um, Joe's just put the link on there for the toolkit on, on the chat screen. Go onto the toolkit, have a look in the resources, and go to the Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire LMC website where they've, they've covered this in really good detail. Which I think brings us very neatly to the uh, completion of our two hours. So do go to the, um, to the toolkit, to the e-learning module. There'll be another e-learning module on upholding coming out probably sometime during the course of December. And uh, thank you very much, particularly um, Philip, David, Paul, for joining us for, for this webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.